Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. As we seek our Heavenly Father's blessing, as we enter into study of his word, shall we unite together in prayer to be guided by him, to understand that which he would have us to know at this time, so that we may be even more prepared for the message that we are about to give. Shall we ask him for his direction, for his guidance and his blessing in all that we are doing? Shall we now join together as we seek his will to be done? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time of probation. We thank you for this time of carrying so that we may come to understand that which you have presented more completely. Help us now and direct us, Father. Show us that which you would have us to know. Guide our words, our thoughts, our discussions. Help us now that we may join together in spirit and in truth, that your angels may guide us, that your spirit may direct us, that our hearts may be open to learn, so that what we learn may be according to that which you would have us to know for this time of verse history. Help us now, Father, as we join with other brothers and sisters in this meeting, and for those that will view this later, that we will look to you to understand what we need to do so that our characters may become in line with yours. May this be your words that are spoken. May this be your character that is seen. Help us to this end. Now we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I'm going to ask a question. What did you take away from last Sabbath's meetings? What did you see? And what was the main basic theme that we have been addressing these last several weeks? As we have been going through Zechariah chapter 4, did we not address the two trees? Yeah, are, olive, olive, olive trees. Yes. Now, what did we find about the olive trees this last week? Uh, it's the New and the Old Testament. And uh, as we can line it to be the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Okay. Now, in, in an article that was published on the 20th of July of 1897, we had the following item presented. The anointed ones standing by the Lord of the whole earth have the position once given to Satan as covering cherub. 
Do you remember addressing this? I mean, this, this is a direct answer first from scripture and then from the spirit of prophecy. Do you remember addressing this? Yeah. Now, if these are the covering cherubs, if these holy beings are being represented by these olive trees where is the message for this time coming from can you repeat oh, that coming, question coming from god's throne okay to repeat the question and then agreeing with what the sister just had to say. Here is Zechariah. The angel that is before Zechariah answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. And said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Review and Herald, 20th of July, 1897, paragraph 5. The anointed one standing by the Lord of the whole earth have the position once given to Satan as covering cherub. Wouldn't, wouldn't, one, of, wouldn't one of them be Gabriel if he's going to do it literally? Agreed. It has to be Gabriel. But why right. does it have to be Gabriel? Because he's the one that was commissioned to give the message to John and to Daniel. Well, if, if he is the one that's giving the message to John and to Daniel, would it not make sense that he is also the one that has given the message to the prophets, such as William Miller, such as Ellen White, such as the other prophets that we find throughout the Bible. Yes. So, as we addressed in Revelation 1, verse 1, how do the message that God would have given to this earth, how does this come? What is the chain of command? God, Jesus, then Gabriel. And then from Gabriel to? Uh, whoever's anointed to the subject that they're trying to uh, work on. Right. Well, can I read them verses, to, to, um, Dwight? Sure, please. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel, which is Gabriel, unto his servant John, who bore a record of the word of God and of uh, the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and that they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Okay. So if the time is at hand, what does that mean to you right now? That means the things that are happening right now. Thank you. For us. Exactly. I agree. Now, I'm going to read this, this paragraph and then jump back to where we were first sharing. God is dishonored when we do not receive the communications which he sends us. Thus, we refuse the golden oil which he would pour into our souls to be communicated to those in darkness. 
What is the golden oil? What have we established over the last couple of weeks as the golden oil? It's got to be the truth. It It is truth, but through whom is that truth coming? Uh, from God. In this case, as, as we studied this this last week, the golden oil that is coming is also the Holy Spirit. Right. So if we're if we reread this sentence, God is dishonored when we do not receive the communication which he sends us. Thus we refuse the Holy Spirit, which he would pour into our souls to be communicated to those in darkness. What would that application say to you? Is this a frightening thought? Well, yeah. Yeah, if you ain't got the golden oil, you can't be you can't be telling people in darkness what it is. So, here again, any can look this up. Review and Herald, 20th of July of 1897. All of these studies with the minor prophets, the so-called minor prophets, have had major emphasis for us today. When the call shall come, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Those who have not received the holy oil, those who have not received the Holy Spirit, who have not cherished the grace of Christ in their hearts, will find, like the foolish virgins, that they are not ready to meet their Lord. They have not in themselves the power to obtain the oil, and their lives are wrecked. But if God's Holy Spirit is asked for, if we plead, as did Moses, show me thy glory, the love of God will be shed abroad in our hearts. Through the golden pipes, the golden oil will be communicated to us, not by might nor by power, but by my what? Spirit. Good saith the Lord of hosts. And we find this in Zechariah 4.6. Now, is there any symbolism in 4.6? Okay. Here. On the 1843 chart, do we not have four or five? Yeah, I think so. I have to look at it. But yeah, I think so. If, if you yes, look, there is the, there is 45. Thank you, Brother McDonald. There is 45. And the 45 led them to what year? 1843. So, so go ahead. Uh, I have uh, several things on 46. It was the number of days that Moses went to the mount, the number of years between the Exodus, the years from 723 to 677. I mean, there's a ton of them. Uh, Millerites built up their spiritual house from 70, uh, 1798 to 1844. It's also the number of chromosomes in humans. And it's connected to 19 and to 65. And also there's a reverse order to 64. And it's also June 4th. So 4-6. If, right. if we are unwilling to be prepared for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, then are we not going to be what Sister White has already described? as the Holy Spirit is 
falling on hearts all around us. Yet many are unable to receive. That's just what it appears like. How are we choosing not to receive the communication that God is sending us? Well, one way is by not believing what the things that we've dug up. Okay, very good. Anyone if we else? If don't believe the things that we dug up, then how can we, how can we perpetuate truth? Agreed. You need to be like the Bereans. And how are you seeing this like the Bereans, my brother? Well, they tested the things which uh, Apostle Paul was teaching. Tested, tested, tested. Studied, studied, studied. Over the last 18 years, many times I would hear things that were strange as far as I was concerned coming from Elder Jeff. But I chose to test all of these things. If I tested and I found them to be correct in line with the Bible, I would accept them. Is that the way the Bereans were? Yes. Now, we've heard many things over the last several years that have come from Parminder, come from Tess, come from others. Many of these statements needed to be tested with Scripture. And what, what would we find as we would test these things? Well, we buy these. Test them with All right. Brother Ron, what were you saying? Oh, I just said we, we either taste the, sweat, the sweetness of it or, you know, it's sour in our mouth. We've got to spit that stuff out. So here again, we're going to return to this. Because if if the other things that were being said were not in line with what had already come before through the scripture, through Father Miller, through Ellen White, are these things that were coming from and through the Holy Spirit? One more time, that question. Were the teachings that we saw from Parminder and Tess, from the one that Elder Jeff would call the soldier, from Tabo, from so many others that came into a disagreement with what Elder Jeff had presented, were these coming through the golden pipes? Were they coming through the Holy Spirit? Uh, no, not those ones that you had talked about just then. They were coming from men. Their own divines. Okay. Through the golden pipes, the golden oil will be communicated to us, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. By receiving the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness, God's children shine as lights in the world. Now, we're going to come down here from, for a couple of paragraphs, and then we're going to shift to a different document. With his own blood, Jesus appears in the presence of God as an intercessor for all who call upon his name. He is the advocate in behalf of the guilty. His blood cleanses from all sin those who accept him as their personal savior. Is he asking that we accept by becoming a member of a church or a movement? No. no member of a message. 
his blood cleanses from all sin those who accept him as their personal savior. Yeah. Membership does not have any advantage. No, it doesn't. The memorial of his sufferings and death upon the cross, the penalty due to the transgressor, is efficacious for all who believe that this propitiation in the presence of God is a perpetual offering. Christ claims that the provision made entitles him to make the assurance to all who seek him. For his sake, the prayers of the penitent who come to him acknowledging Christ as their Savior should be accepted as yea and amen, their sins blotted out, and the holy oil bestowed upon them. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, what be those two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Zechariah 4, 11 to 14. Here the messengers of God are represented by the olive branches through which the golden pipe empty the golden oil out of themselves. This is the heavenly, vital communication from God to every soul who is emptied of self. The heavenly oil communicated to the human agent is to be given to those who are consecrated channels to for forth flow forth from them to others. Is this to be given to a single party? No. It's for mass distribution. So does the heavenly oil come to one single party to many? Negative. Does this heavenly oil come from selected, consecrated, emptied of self parties to be given to all? That would be the gist of the whole thing. Okay. This verse says that God has those who, how does it go? God has. Others that thought of this fall. In the time of Elijah, yeah. Brother William, yeah. did did Elijah believe he was the only prophet of God? Yes, he did. And what was he told? He told it he said it was seven thousand reserved. Who hadn't bent the knee. Is there anything special about the number seven or seven thousand? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Are we in agreement in reading these passages that from the Bible, from those that serve as covering cherub, that we are receiving a message? For this time. I'm, I'm sorry again please. Are we in agreement. That. Through. These messengers. The covering cherubs. The messengers that are represented by the olive branches, that we are receiving a message that is pertinent for this time. Oh, yeah. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Now, 
we're going to look at a different document. And here we're going, we're going to move very quickly through this. There's going to be some questions I'll be asking, but we're going to move quickly through this. As you can see, this is a unpublished document. This came in 1897. This came while Mrs. White was in Australia. Following close upon the disaffection of brothers Shannon and blank came the apostasy of brethren McCullough and Hawkins. In the summer of 1896, a severe sickness, which almost cost, cost brother McCullough his life, caused him to move to Adelaide to seek the benefits of a milder climate. At the close of the Adelaide camp meeting that summer, he with Elder Hawkins, a Wesleyan minister who had recently been converted to the truth, was left to bind off the work of the camp meeting. For a time, Brother Wilson and his wife labored with them. When they returned to Tasmania, these two men were left to work together. The first news of the apostasy reached Melbourne in the form of the resignation of these two brethren, which they sent to Elder Daniels, saying they could no longer conscientiously be connected with Seventh-day Adventists. Elder Daniels telegraphed the word to us, and we at once made arrangements for Brother G.B. Starr and his wife to go to Adelaide, and for Brother Pallant to carry on the work in Queensland in Brother Starr's absence. Brethren Daniels and Colcord went immediately to Adelaide, where they found a determined rebellion. When they arrived, Brethren McCullough and Hawkins refused to converse with them. They had given out an appointment for a meeting on a Sunday evening and asked Brother Daniels to speak in the tent that same evening. And asked Brother Daniels to speak in the tent. Excuse me. Thus, this he refused to do, going instead to hear them. They had repeatedly said that they would have nothing to say against Seventh-day Adventists. It was found that these men, while under the pay of the conference, had been working in a most subtle manner until the whole church was being carried away by their deceptions. Their entrancing theory was the Holy Spirit, sanctification, nothing but Christ. Doctrines they taught were of no value. They had presented these deceptive theories working as the great apostate work in heaven in the first rebellion. Indeed, their work seemed a repetition on a small scale of the working of the first great rebel. So they were teaching that um, all you need is the Holy Spirit sanctification, nothing but Christ, and that the doctrines are not important. And Correct. We've heard that. How many times have we heard this before? Well, too many to count. Where I live right now, we have many that are saying that there is no Holy Spirit. Yet, what did we just read just a few moments ago? What did we read last week? Did we not see from the pen of inspiration that the Holy Spirit is providing the golden oil for this time. Yes. Do we not have great need of sanctification? Absolutely. Where do we obtain sanctification? If we're looking at the tabernacle at this time. The steps are justification, sanctification, judgment. Where do we see justification? The courtyard. Yeah, that's the first uh, step. Agreed. Do we not see this in the courtyard at the foot of the cross? 
Yeah. Yes. Yes. So therefore, where where do we experience sanctification? In the hurry, please. Exactly. When we are being given the sanctification experience, are we not undergoing the experience of the second angel's message? Yeah, one would think. As this document, which is manuscript 186, continued. In all my experience, I have never met with such deep laid plottings as was revealed in this apostasy. These men gave no intimation of their purpose until they had everything prepared to make the break and carry the whole church with them. Without intimating to me one word of any difficulty, or giving me opportunity to speak for myself, they had visited from house to house and told the most wicked falsehoods against about me and my work. It was not merely the apostasy of these two brethren that we had to regret. It was their power to hurt the church and to make a lie appear to be truth. I know, for I have been with them, these accusers say. I know the ins and outs of the matter, and many thought they spoke the truth. Nearly the entire church was captivated by their presentations. Brothers and sisters, did we not see that nearly the entire movement was captivated by Parminder and Tess? Uh, yeah, most definitely. Are we not still dealing with the seeds of their rebellion? Yes. Elder Haskell was summoned. Excuse me. I just said the little weeds are still springing up here and there. I apologize for not giving you the opportunity to speak. Oh, no problem. Elder Haskell was summoned to Adelaide. It was thought that as he had ordained both Elder McCullough and Elder Hawkins, he might possibly be able to save these poor deluded men. He stood there amid the difficulties arising from the apostasy and met the workings of Satan through human agencies. After earnest labor for the church, nearly all those who were deceived were able to say, the Lord hath redeemed us from the snare of the fowler, and we are escaped. They saw their error in listening to the words of these men, and again took their position for the truth. I felt deeply over the sudden apostasy of Brother McCullough. I cannot say the apostasy of Brother Hawkins, for he was greatly deceived by one who was himself deceived by Satan. The raid that was made against me was mostly a Brother McCullough's devising. He began the work of disaffection by criticism. For two years, he had been finding fault with every minister in the work and had been serving the enemy of God by uniting with him in the work of accusing the brethren. The first step in this direction is a dangerous one for any angel to take. Is that the way it reads? The first step in this direction is a dangerous one for any human being to take. We've already seen what happened in the heavenly courts. The great apostate pushed his case before all. The great apostate according to scripture, took a third of the host with him. Here is where these brethren fell. And this is where many will fall. To complain of our brethren in the ministry, 
to be suspicious of the gifts the Lord has set in the church, to seek for spot or stain in the action of our fellow workers, is to follow in the enemy's steps. When we are critical of others, when we are choosing by rumor and innuendo to put down the work that is being done, who are we following? Satan. We did that. We did that in heaven to get got a third of the angels or a third of the angels by doing that. He who chooses to obtain this class of education will find Satan standing ready to help in a masterly manner. Whose banner is being followed at this time? Is it the black banner of the great apostate or is it the red banner of Prince Emmanuel? Well, it depends on who we're talking about. We're talking about uh, everybody or uh, particular uh, groups? As I've given these presentations, I think I've been very clear that I have a problem pointing fingers, right? Yeah. Because if I point one finger at someone else, what's the other part of the story? Three on the face. Three are finger. pointing at me. Exactly. The paragraph continued, then having criticized all that to him appears out of joint, he will commence to weave webs of falsehood, abusing the confidence that has been reposed in him and seeking to destroy the reputation of those who have ever been his truest friends. This is the class of work done in Adelaide. Have we not been seeing this occurring within the movement? Yes. We should work earnestly to close the door against those who work, who in this way are serving under Satan's bend. What does that mean? Close the door. Well, <clears throat> our, did was Ellen White given a vision mm -hmm. about a ship on the ocean? Oh, yeah. And came to that iceberg. You talk about the iceberg one? Yes, I am. Yeah. And what did she say about this? Go forward, crush through. Push through, push through. What, something what like were that. the two? What were the two words that were used in this vision? You hit it head on. That was it. Was she? Not, did she not say we are to meet it? Meet it. Yes. yes. Yeah. We should work earnestly to close the door against those who, in this way, are serving under Satan's banner, for they are doing their best to counter the prayer of Christ. Neither. Pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. John 17, 20 to 23. To his disciples Christ said, A new commandment give I unto you, that you love one another, 
as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love for one another. Are we Christ's disciples when we are being critical of our brothers and sisters? No. We're being, we're being uh, participants with the enemy. Brother William, I'm going to ask you to read this next portion, this next set, this one sentence that is put in bold. Okay. Our work is to stop sur, sur, surmising. surmising evil of our brother. What does it mean to us today that our work is to stop surmising evil of our brethren? Well, it means if, you, if you're thinking something evil about that brother... You surmise an evil, ain't you? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Agreeable. Is that how you would read it, Brother Jeff? Yeah, I've seen it like that, yeah. And Brother McDonald, how do you say What do you say? Where Are you in agreement? Yes. Okay. Our work is to stop surmising evil of our brethren. We should seek to press together and thus fulfill the longing of Christ to see his chosen people love one another as he loves them. If we are not loving one another, if we are not working and pressing together, are we not denying Christ? Uh, yeah. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? The psalmist asks. Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly is the response, and worketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned, and he Honoreth them that fear the Lord, he that sweareth to his own hurt, and changeth not, he that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. Psalm 15, 1 to 5. You know, the question I ask is, have I done that first sentence? That's what I'm asking myself. Have I done that first sentence? Is this not what we need to be asking ourselves each day? <laughs> Have I been thinking or stating evil about our brethren? We have to look at our own hearts. We are being put into a, a vision. We know what the cow zone is. We know what the mara is. And we know the mara brings us into this vision like John, like Daniel, like Ezekiel, where as we are having this vision, we are being brought before Christ and we are being shown how unworthy we are. Our work is to stop surmising evil of our brethren needs to be kept in mind all of the time. These things, are the things that ye shall do. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor, execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates, and let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against your neighbor, and love no false oath. For all these things I hate, 
saith the Lord. These things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. John 15, 17 to 19. We read of the false witness born of Christ. And we know that every child of rebellion will do this evil work. Do we wish to be known as a child of rebellion? Where do we stand today? Go ahead. I said no. Okay. If they spoke against Christ, who was without spot or stain, they will surely speak against his followers. What reproach they heaped upon Christ. Shall we complain when we are made partakers of his reproach? Remember no. the word that I spake unto you, Christ said. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. John 15, 20. Those who draw away from us and remain not in the truth will fabricate reasons why they did not remain steadfast. They will do as Satan did. They will cast the reproach upon someone else. God himself will be accused of unfairness. But should not the professed followers of Christ be afraid to treat their brethren and sisters as the Jewish nation treated the world's redeemer? We have had to pass through this experience again and again. The apostasy brought trial to us and largely increased my burdens in writing. But we must expect to meet these trials and disappointments. The apostle Paul warned the disciples, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to the flock of God over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the flock of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Acts 20, 28 to 30. Brothers and sisters, so much of what we are seeing here has been a repeat of the experience that Mrs. White had throughout her ministry. We are seeing this as also a repeat that was predicted by Paul, that was seen by Peter, that was seen by Christ. When we have those that are willing to decide that we're not going to listen to what others are presenting, that we're not going to examine this to see what light can be gleaned, we are seeing actions that are ongoing just as the great apostate did. And that's hard to have to say. Many times we are going to be seeing 
those that are claiming the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But does the guidance of the Holy Spirit ever go contrary to the word of God or to the spirit of prophecy? Uh, no. No, it does not. So if it does not go contrary to what has gone before, are we to be following it? Are we to follow guidance given by those that have been great speakers but are now advocating a different path? No, we don't. No. What can we take away from what, from what we have read today? Well, um, you're, you shouldn't be talking schmack about your, your neighbors in any way, shape, or form. Um, you should be, uh, uh trying to, uh, for people that are, that are, con con uh, saying that they're following Christ and they're speaking, uh, publicly, uh, we have the obligation to, examine what they're saying and choose for ourselves using the Holy Spirit, whether or not they agree with the, uh, as you say, the spirit of prophecy in the Holy Bible, uh, put those in reverse though, Holy Bible and then spirit of prophecy. Okay. Are we to be gossiping? No. Are we to slander others? Absolutely not. So, when this is occurring, especially within the church, is this according to God's direction? No, it's not. Whose direction is it coming through? The enemy. Okay. When these types of things are found, they are to be treated as the iceberg. Does that analogy make sense to you? We are to meet it. We are to shut it down. We are to see that it has no place within our worship, within our conversation, within our thoughts, within our hearts. <clears throat> any other thought or any other question? Okay, now, I went through this, I went through this entire document. This manuscript 186, we jumped from paragraph 16 down to paragraph 45. There is a lot within this particular document that is very specific for us today. I was led that we should look strictly at these paragraphs for our consideration in this study. We are going to be returning next week to portions of this study of Zechariah 4. We need to keep this in mind as we study on our own and as we study together through the week. 
not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord, is to be where our reliance is going to need to be. Because we cannot do this of our own. Not in human wisdom, not in human strength, not in human understanding of any kind. Shall we now close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these examples. We thank you for these warnings, for these admonitions, and for these instructions. Thank you for providing this to our darkened minds. Help us now, Father, to be able to place these in practice. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity we have to assemble together. We ask, Father, for your blessing and your guidance. Direct us now, be with us in all things. Show us, Father, that which you would have us to do. We ask, Father, for your blessing upon Brother Theodore as he presents the next message. Help us and guide us to place into practice that which you have presented before us. May your angels attend us. May we come to understand and accept the chastisement that is necessary so that we may indeed become the kind of golden bowls that are necessary to give the message that you would have given at this time. Thank you, Father, for these blessings, for this Sabbath, and for your love. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen.